Hallelujah. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom our hearts are open, all desires in him, and from whom that secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and perfectly love thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith: Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, who through thy only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, hast overcome death and opened unto us the gate of everlasting life. We humbly beseech thee that, as by thy special grace preventing us, Thou dost put into our minds good desires, so by thy continual help we may bring the same to good effect. Through the same of thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost heaven, one God, world without end. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who makest us glad with the yearly festival of the resurrection of thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, mercifully grant that we may so observe this temporal feast, that we may be found worthy to attain to everlasting felicity. Through the same of thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. The epistle beginneth in the twelfth verse of the third chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. In those days, Peter answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, the God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his Son, Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Here ended the lesson. Children, 
have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and he shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to the Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his father's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far off from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon and bread. Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up, and drew the net to land full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was the knot the net broken. Jesus said unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh, and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish like loves. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved, because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. Praise be to thee, O Christ. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us, said a conscious Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and descended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead. His kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Jesus saith unto him, Follow me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 
On this Easter Wednesday, we continue to read the Easter Gospels, and in all of them, they begin with Christ already risen from the dead. His condemnation by earthly judges as a sinner, overturned by God's great act of vindicating judgment that the scripture calls justification. The tomb is empty, the stone is rolled away, and the door is open for his disciples to follow him uh, through his death into the life of resurrection and to take up his mission to the world as witnesses preaching repentance and remission of sins among all nations in his name. Yet, it's apparent, the empty tomb, the angel's message, the witness of other disciples is not enough. Jesus himself has to come to them in his risen life before they are able to follow him, to pass over with him from doubt to faith, from sorrow to joy. And as we saw yesterday, Easter Tuesday, from sin to righteousness, by the forgiveness of sins and the justification of sinners. So, what Jesus has completed and accomplished for us in our place and on our behalf in his death and resurrection must now be accomplished in us by him. And the Easter Gospels are a template for that process. They show us how we may follow him. Now, when you're reading these accounts, um, it's easy to think that this passing over from doubt to faith, from sorrow to joy, from sin to righteousness, is a kind of straight line, linear progression. But there are indications that it took more than one experience of the risen Christ to anchor them in this new reality, this new life, and this new faith. Perhaps the most important of these is the one we read today as the Gospel lesson for Easter Wednesday, the 21st chapter of St. John. It begins with, this, with seven of the disciples, seven of the twelve, back home in Galilee and out fishing. They are back where they started. When Jesus first called them, those fishermen, to be fishers of men. That's not the only echo of the past that's in this Gospel lesson from John 21. For, as in the story of the calling of Peter, James, and John that St. Luke tells in the fifth chapter of his Gospel, these disciples have fished all night and have nothing to show for it. And in the morning, on their return to shore, someone on the shore directs them to put down their nets again, and this time, they have an extraordinarily huge catch, a great draft of fishes. As in Luke's story of the walk to Emmaus, the disciples do not at first recognize this stranger they've encountered. Only when the marvelous catch of fish materializes does John, with characteristic quickness of insight, recognize him and say it is the Lord. Unlike the event in Luke 5, the first calling, this time the net does not break. And as in the multiplication of loaves and fishes told in John chapter 6, of all this miraculous abundance, nothing is lost. And in a further echo, on the shore, Jesus prepares for them a meal of bread and fish, just as he did for the multitude in the wilderness. In ways that stir deep memories of their time with Jesus, the stranger on the shore, whom thou thy recognize as the risen Lord, points them to where they can find abundance, as he did in their first calling, and offers them sustenance, as he did with the loaves and fishes in the wilderness. What he once gave to them, he still gives life in abundance, and life in fellowship and communion with him. And so, in the resurrection, he has 
called them once more, as he did at the first, called these fishermen to be fishers of men, called them to share in his mission as apostles, and they recognize him in this calling, and they recognize themselves also. So what they've experienced in these rather wonderful and mysterious events at the Sea of Galilee is a kind of recovery, a past memory, that is not simply regression, but actually restoration, renewal, and advance towards the fulfillment of their calling. This recovery of memory, this recovery uh, of their first calling to be fishers of men, to be apostles, is also a coming to terms with the apostasy that followed, in which the initial hope and promise were followed by forsaking and denial when he was arrested and condemned. If there is grace and mercy for the disciples still, as this story most certainly indicates, it's a grace and mercy that involves coming to terms with the truth of their past. And this is especially the case for Simon Peter. Remember what Jesus said to Peter at the Last Supper. Peter asked Jesus, where are you going? Jesus told Peter, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Peter won't hear that. He contradicts Jesus. Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. It's a bold claim. Jesus answered him, wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow, till thou hast denied me thrice. So Jesus at the Last Supper had told Peter that he could not follow him now, but would only follow him after. In fact, that far from following him now, he would deny him three times. And this Peter could not hear, could not accept. His greatest need was to keep up his image of himself as a strong leader. But the one who most needed to keep up with this image of himself was, of course, the most conspicuous failure, who did indeed not follow Jesus, but denied him, disowned him, three times, and with an oath, decisively. Now Jesus gently takes him back through this failure by asking him, do you love me? Not once, not twice, but three times. And three times, in response to this opportunity, Peter avows his love for Jesus. And not once, not twice, but three times, Jesus tells him, feed my sheep. And then, after speaking of his coming death as a martyr, the death by which he should glorify God, Jesus says very simply, follow me. And so Jesus indicates to Peter that the time he had spoken of at the Last Supper, before the cross, before the resurrection, has now come for Peter to follow Jesus on the road that Jesus traveled first and the the great shepherd of the sheep who had given up his life for them. Now it's Simon Peter's turn and time to care for the sheep and to give his life for his Lord. There's something of course very beautiful and moving about this account of the conversation of Peter and Jesus in John 21. But it's got a point that extends to more than just Simon Peter. It's this. The Simon Peter's following Jesus in the way. In the way that Jesus pioneered in his own death and resurrection. 
in shepherding the sheep and laying down his life. That is not something Peter can accomplish by his own strength, but only in virtue of all that Christ has already accomplished for him. Peter can only follow Jesus in this way because Jesus has first pioneered the way. And Peter can only follow Jesus in this way as one who himself has repented and received remission of sins, as one who has himself accepted the truth about his own past and received the abiding love of Jesus as the ground of a restored and renewed fellowship and ministry in the present and in the future. That says something important about Peter's ministry. It says something important about the entire missions of the church, its witness to the resurrection, its proclamation of repentance and remission of sins among all nations in his name. Only men whose pride has been broken who know themselves as sinners, restored by grace, for Christ's sake only. Only they are enabled to bring that grace and mercy to the world that rejected him. Only someone like Peter, whose heart has been broken and remade in this fashion, who had failed and been forgiven, only he could bring the same message to his fellow Jews in Jerusalem as today's lesson from the Acts uh, tells. First, there must be truth, just as there was for him. He confronts them with their own denial of Jesus. They had, he said, denied God's Son in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. They had denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto them. And they had killed the Prince of Life, whom God had raised from the dead. This is a devastating revelation of the truth of what they had done. And if Peter had just stopped there, he would have left them condemned and hopeless in their guilt. But Peter does not stop there, because Jesus did not stop there with him. They acted, he said, in the blindness of misguided zeal. I walked that through ignorance he did it, as did also your rulers. Ignorant, not because they lacked opportunity to know better, as if Jesus had not taught them, but because, like Peter himself and the other disciples, they had not understood the great design and purpose of God set forth in the scriptures that was being fulfilled in Jesus. Now, however, that they see clearly what they have done and what God was accomplishing, they have a responsibility. Repent ye therefore, and turn that your sins may be blotted out. Repent and turn, for in accepting the truth about their own past, their own actions, their own choices, they will find grace, mercy, forgiveness, love, and fellowship with the risen Lord in the present and in the future. Grace and mercy will they find, even those that bade for his blood, even the leaders that engineered his execution. Well, this is how we pass over from sin to righteousness, from guilt to grace, from wrath to favor, from death to life, through him who died and rose again for us. This is what is proclaimed in the gospel among all nations. This is the ministry of Peter, the ministry of reconciliation, speaking the truth in love. And this is the ministry of the whole church and of every Christian. But as with Peter, so with us. This ministry is ours. Only when we ourselves have had our hearts broken and remain 
by receiving the truth and the love that is in Jesus and the redemption he's accomplished for us in our place and on our behalf. May we know and experience the reconciling and redemptive truth and love of Christ and be his witnesses in all the world.
power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Increase, O Lord, our faith in thee, that we may work thy pleasure only. Let us pray. Most bountiful and benign Lord God, we thy humble servants, freely redeemed and justified by the passion, death, and resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, having our full trust of salvation therein, most humbly desire it, so to strengthen our faith and illumine us with thy grace, that we may walk and live in thy favor, and after this life be partakers of thy glory in the everlasting kingdom of heaven. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, and one God, world without end. Peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always.